The information economy has arrived. The world is teeming with innovation as new business models reinvent every industry. Every industry. Inside Analysis is your source of information and insight about how to make the most of this exciting new era. Learn more at InsideAnalysis.com. InsideAnalysis.com. And now, here's your host, Eric Tavanaugh. <laughs> Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the future. Indeed, as William Gibson once said, the future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed yet. That's our line from Future Proof, your host here, Eric Cavanaugh, the only coast to coast radio show all about the information economy. And uh, boy, am I excited for today, folks. Last week, we had some great guests, including Naveen Rao, the CEO of Mosaic ML, which just got acquired by Databricks for $1.3 billion and one of the fastest deals ever made in our industry, quite frankly, really impressive stuff. And Databricks is just on a tear. They also rolled out their own vector database. We'll talk about those on the show today. They're doing amazing things with their data warehouse and with data orchestration and even this whole thing about Iceberg and Delta Lake and Hootie and the different possibilities. They solved it by just looking at the parquet files. So look all that stuff up. It's a really impressive array of innovations coming out of Silicon Valley these days and, of course, all around the world. But our guest today knows a lot about all those things and also knows a lot about LLMs. So I was going to joke. Anyone remember data science? We used to talk about data science all the time. Then we started talking about data mesh and, of course, data products. And then it's large language models, and AI has just taken the world by storm. Well, data science is still around, and what we're going to talk about today is really automating the hard part of data science to get to the value quickly. So cost to value, time to value, get those really in a, a nice happy place that's going to make CEOs happy. It's going to make customers happy. We're going to talk all about these large language models and uh, ETL for LLMs. So with that, let me bring in Brian Raymond from unstructured.io. Brian, you folks are doing some really interesting things out there, and I'd like to help our audience kind of wrap their heads around the magnitude of what's happening. And I think you had mentioned to me that there's been something like $30 billion of investment in LLMs in the last six to eight months or so, which is a pretty staggering number that shows you that the VC community sees where the rabbit is running now and that's where they're going, right? Yeah, it's an incredible shift, especially from where we were 12 months ago. Everyone expecting a recession, massive tech layoffs, contraction on innovation budgets in the commercial sector to the, the run that we've seen since the beginning of the year on the heels of diffusion models first last summer, and then large language models, which was, which was really sparked by the introduction of ChatGPT last November. But right. now we have dozens and dozens of LLMs that are emerging um, every month. Yeah. And so our audience, our core audience who understand data warehousing and analytics and business intelligence, well, they all know ETL, extract, transform, load. That's been the mainstay of data warehousing for arguably almost 40 years or so since the earliest days when we figured out that you could not run analytics on enterprise systems like ERPs, for example. They're not designed to do that. They're designed to move stuff around and get the job done. So we invented this whole data warehouse concept. ETL is how you move things. But you're doing a very special kind of ETL and of unstructured data. So we talk all the time about 80% of the data in the enterprise is unstructured. It's in Word documents, emails, PDFs, PowerPoint presentations, et cetera. The structured data, well, that's the numbers of how much product we've sold, et cetera, what the cost was. The context for the structured data comes from the unstructured data. But historically, it's it's been just in the mind, really, of the analyst or the user to kind of piece that together themselves but now with these large language models, and in particular with what unstructured.io is doing, you can actually pull out this corpus of context and you also kind of clean it and refine it and get it to the textual value that's going to be used, right? Tell us about that and how that works. Yeah, I mean, we use the, the phrase ETL for LLMs. Uh, for all the smart listeners, that's, that's um, a metaphor that breaks down very quickly. In reality, it's probably cl something closer to connect, transform, stage. And what that means in practice is that we're, we're building enterprise-grade connectors, kind of like what Fivetran Tran has done in Airbyte, but that are built from the ground up for files containing natural language data to all their major repositories where those live. So think Amazon S3, Azure Blob, SharePoint, 
you know, Google Drive, wherever these these files contain natural language, they are are generated and, and then saved down. So we're able to grab those on the transform stage um, instead of you know mapping relational databases to to one another. What we're doing is we're doing a couple of things. We're doing file transformation first. So those PDFs, PPTXs, XLS, whichever the file extension might be, getting um, extracting the natural language data out of the, out of it and rendering it into a common JSON format, typically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then on the staging side, getting it ready for the analytics downstream. And so that might be tokenization, vectorization, chunking schema mapping to the particular JSON schema that's required given the given the task downstream. Either way, what's it that has in common with ETL is that this is data engineering. And this mm -hmm. is a data engineering in service of data science, of mm -hmm. machine learning, and making this data available to models. And we'll I know we'll talk more about how it's being made available either through training or through vector databases. But that critical step of how do you connect to that knowledge where it's being stored transform it into um, a common format and then get it ready is um, is a very slow and manual process still today in 2023. Yeah, and uh, you had mentioned something that I think is quite compelling that when you're extracting, let's say, from a Word document or from a PowerPoint presentation, your technology has the capacity to identify headers versus subheads versus body text, et cetera. And folks have probably seen this now, and there are some great algorithms in the engines that we use, like on Google and YouTube and other places where it'll automatically put tables of contents together. Or you look at something like Otter AI taking notes on your meetings, and it'll say who said what, when, and, and even distill that for you and do some analysis dynamically for you, which is incredibly powerful. I mean, you think about all the ways we used to take notes and just try to keep track of what we had heard and go back to your notes and explain, well, now it's all recorded and it's all translated and it's organized for you. And it sounds like that's kind of what you're doing with this unstructured data is you're able to pull out the, the value, the signal, which is what you want anyway, and then plug that signal into the model to stage it somewhere to be able to leverage it for some analytical purpose, right? That's a, that's, that's exactly right. And in, in practice, we think about it as as both cleaning the data and so getting rid of unwanted artifacts. So if you OCR something, use optical character recognition, right, or under, undergo that file transformation process, there's almost always just nasty artifacts that data engineers and data scientists who are doing this data engineering right. have to confront: white right. spaces, Unicode characters, sentence fragments, these sorts of things. So that you got to clean it up. But then you need to curate your data, and this is something that folks have been thinking about a long time. When you have columns and rows. But um, within, with respect to natural language processing, suppose you have an analyst research report. Everyone's kind of seen one of these, say it's on Ford Motor Company over the last quarter. That analyst research report might have a text box that's talking about GM. It may have a section down below talking about the broader economy. It may have another section talking about supply chain issues, but just like a meandering body paragraph that's actually talking about the equity itself mm -hmm. or the security. Um, and that's what you want to push through your machine learning model, your pipeline, or make available to your large language model at scale. And so in that example, how do you take thousands of these that all have different layouts that are maybe saved in you know, a dozen different file formats and curate that natural language data and so you could park it somewhere to make it available? Right now, the answer is, and historically the answer has been custom regular expressions, Python scripts, off-the-shelf OCR for every single document layout. Mm -hmm. So it's, right. it's a slow, painful process, and that's where we're focused on trying to make it faster and easier. Yeah, that's that's really remarkable. And, you know, when I think about topics like information lifecycle management, right, like information comes in, it gets used, it gets stored. I mean, just even the basics of storage, like when I went over the weekend, I've been thinking about our conversation last week and thinking to myself, this is big in so many ways. I mean, just deduping, for example, just the, the number of duplicate documents that people have in large organizations, what's the average, like seven, they say, per document, I mean, depending upon which study you look at. So that's a whole lot of wasted space and wasted uh, time and effort, et cetera. And it's also just chaos there. I mean, basically, unstructured data is chaos right now in most organizations. And you are providing a mechanism to extract the meaning from those environments and then feed them into these foundational models or, or large language models or whatever, that is a huge deal. I mean, it's almost the kind of thing, and I joked about this when I was writing an article about knowledge graphs, that 
you know, so many organizations have had to choose, do we actually make sense of all the stuff that we have, or do we just focus on the now and do what's needed at the moment? And of course, they all do the latter and just sweep the rest under the SharePoint, as I joked about it. But now you'll be able to, to extract that value. And then you could do even interesting things about the storage, right? Once you have it out, if you're not required by law to keep these things, you can drop all that stuff or at least put it in super cold storage somewhere where it's not costing you a lot of money. Point being, this is a, it's a revolution of information management. What do you think? I think we've seen kind of three, three stages unfold since last November. And so, especially with respect to large language models, the first was, hey, let's just use what's in memory. Let's just ask chat GPT questions and see how far, and see how far we get. And that was incredible. Um, and then around the you know December, January, February timeframe, folks started saying, hey, what if we connected these with external data, right? And made it available either by retraining um, models like Bloom, which was one of the first open source LMs or, uh, or putting in a vector database. And so they grab data mostly off the internet that was already in a fairly clean format that you can get over API and made it available and built some really cool applications on top of that. And then as we progressed throughout the spring, folks were like, you know what, if we're actually going to deploy these things, if we're going to, you know, the MIT study, Goldman Sachs study showing the productivity promise of these, the productivity, the, you know, the promise of the productivity gains with these, we're going to have to take all of our private data and utilize it in conjunction with these models. Then it said, okay, we can't, it's not just what's in memory. It's not just the data that's easy that's already out there. It's the hard data that we're continuing to produce tens of thousands of files every day. How do we do that? And that's the reality that the industry as a whole is confronting kind of head on right now wow. as we take cool prototypes and start to transition them into production. Right. That's such a big deal. And you had told me before the show too that you know, really there are two paths that organizations can take. And one is to embed your data into the model that you chose to use or put it into these vector databases. And then you've got a layer of abstraction, basically. You've got the model and then it reaches out to the vector database as it needs to. That strikes me as the way to go, frankly. It's sort of uh, loosely coupled, if you will, as opposed to tightly coupled. Tell us about that and how you're parked to the left of either option. Sure. So as you mentioned, kind of, Path number one is to either pre-train or fine-tune um, a model with your data. And so this is um, where Mosaic ML comes in. They're fantastic. We're customers of Mosaic ML. We've pre-trained our own model um, using them. And the objective there is how do you take your data and then encode it into that into the memory of that model? And so it knows um, it's seen and is familiar with and can answer questions about your data. There's two problems with that, or shortcomings, I should say, why that's not sufficient in and of itself. The first is recency, latency of the data. Mm -hmm. And so it's frozen in time. And so what that requires is for you to periodically curate large batches of new data, label it, and then re-encode it in. So you're paying for the labeling costs, you're paying for the compute costs, and the time and energy to run those projects. Mm -hmm. It's the world that we've been in, um, call it over the last 10 years, and there, it's still um, it's still required for a lot of the the cap like you know the the large LM based projects that we're doing. However, a new kind of path has emerged, and it's on the back of a technique called retrieval augmented generation (RAG) mm -hmm. short mm -hmm. in vector databases. And here, what you do is you park a bunch of your data in a vector database with vectorized embedding representation. So kind of call it, think of it like a 70 digit string of numbers. So it's a multi-dimensional representation of that text. Mm -hmm. And as you prompt a model, what it does, is it looks at what it has in memory, but then also reaches over and grabs relevant data from the vector database, considers it all together and, um, and produces a response. That solves the second problem, which is hallucin hallucinations. Right. Um, it's not a silver bullet, but what you can do is you can anchor it. You can make it show homework. Um, and so you have chain of thought reasoning. That's a, bunch a great of way to describe it. Yeah. yeah, I'm writing this down. You can anchor it. That's exactly right. So you're, I mean, you're optimizing your chances of getting a real governed, trusted answer out of this thing, as opposed to hallucination. And, you know, I'd mentioned to you that when I was covering the Databricks conference, the go-to-market guy, uh, Adam, something from... Uh, ChatGPT was engaging with me on Twitter, which of course is now called X, 
for whatever reason. I think that's odd that uh, Elon took a page out of Mark Zuckerberg's book to rename his platform. But anyway, we'll we'll see where all that goes. But he was pointing out that hallucinations are a feature, not a bug. And the idea here is with these large language models, they are predictive engines, and their job is to predict what text it, they think you want to hear based upon your prompts, right? So they're really fusing vectors of information together dynamically in prose formats to create content, either marketing content or business proposals or whatever. So like, it's not going to go away completely, but to your point, to anchor it like that is to give it tremendous weight and to basically gravitate it toward the truth, right? Yeah. And for it to be able to show that somewhere. So say it uh, produces, uh, you know, a TPS memo, <laughs> a page like TPS memo, <laughs> right? Um, you should be able to drill down and on this paragraph, um, you know, what documents underlie the inference, you know, that, that, gen yes. that, that, that generated that. And that's achievable using techniques like RAG and, and, you know, some of the iterations of that. Yeah. I mean, that's very, very powerful. And so you, you do wind up getting into a conversation with this engine and you walk through it and you help it understand things and it helps you understand things. It's a very bi-directional thing in that sense, right? Because, you're trying to get to the bottom of something and you're trying to generate. That's what they do. These are generative models. Generative AI generates stuff. It creates new things, right? It absolutely does. And so like the, it, it is a feature, not a bug, but at the same time, if you're depending on this for business purposes, you don't want a five-year-old that's completely fabricating information. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you want something, uh, something more like Encyclopedia Britannica where it's written, but then you can drill down on sources and citations. That's and right. so, um, and and there's a wide spectrum there in between on, on what and what you can produce using these models. Yeah, there is an absolutely wide spectrum and it's a learning process. But that's the other thing that gets me really excited about this is that especially when you train it using your own data, you now have this very robust window pane into your organization's text and imagery and and language and messaging so you can look for these things and then that's a whole discovery process right and to me discovery has always been one of the most important parts of any sort of analytical process because you know first of course you gather data you organize data in the old world you had to come up with your data model early your schema basically your start your snowflake or whatever you're going to do Kim kimball versus inman that kind of stuff but you had to decide ahead of time what that that plumbing was going to look like. Well, that's very fragile and that's very um, difficult to uh, to use in a fast changing world. And so what we have now is a much more robust way to understand what the data is telling us. Tell me what the mo mo model should look like. Tell me what the process is should look like, still vet it, still make your own decisions, but it's a much different and much more dynamic and flexible world. Well, folks, don't touch that dial. I'll be right back. You are listening to Inside Analysis. Welcome back to Inside Analysis. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Oh, yes, folks. Take us to the future indeed. That's exactly what large language models are doing. <laughs> They're taking us to the future right now. We're going there right now, folks. It's very exciting stuff. I've played around with these. They are very powerful and they're good at lots of different things. Like one of the things they're very good at is summarizing. Like you can give it a hundred page document and tell it, give me a two page summary of this and then dive into this, dive into that. Very, very powerful research tool and content creation tool as well. And of course, underpinning all this is NLP, natural language processing, which has been around for a very long time, decades, quite frankly, uh, and it really didn't get anywhere for a long time. And it was kind of stumbling. And then of course, Siri came out and Bixby and all these others, and we got better at that stuff. But one of the things I've learned talking uh, with Unstructured here is that uh, the dirty secret of natural language processing these days is that many data science teams are still building one-off artisanal models. And it takes a tremendous amount of time. It takes a tremendous amount of effort. And uh, by the time you're done, the world has probably changed a little bit. So that's what's really changing. And that affects the cost, that affects the viability, that affects what people try. Because think about it, in large organizations, man, you you better have a good feeling about the bet that you're going to put a million bucks on that it's going to come to pass and generate value uh, and that's been a very difficult thing so tell us a bit about that uh brian sure thing so i i would i would say that um with 
in any any NLP project um, industry wide, you're looking at about a twenty percent success rate historically um, with an enterprise, about an eighty percent failure rate, and there's a number of challenges here. This isn't because the folks who are working on it didn't try hard enough or aren't smart enough. Um, you're challenged in two different areas. One is on the NLP side itself, right before, right at the at the point of inference, and one is on the pre-processing side. So starting with like the, the NLP side itself, a huge leap forward with the introduction of transform-based models um, over their predecessors in terms of the power of the models. However, let me give you an example. If you wanted to train a model to extract people, like a named entity recognition model, you could do that. And then if you wanted to have it identify folks as, you know, where they work or where they live or, you know, where they went to college, mm -hmm. you need some other relation extraction model. For each one of those relations, person and college or person and hometown, that's a separate model that requires separate labeled data and maintenance over time. So you end up with these Byzantine uh, model pipelines in order to produce, you know, the structured data that, that you're going to need. Fairly straightforward, but labor intensive. And so in terms of the economics, it had to drive a tremendous amount of value to make sense. However, if you introdu introduced any complexity in terms of the data feeding into that pipeline, uh, now compounding the economic challenges. And this is the data engineering challenge that never received any VC money, it didn't receive hardly any attention. This is where we're really focused, which was, all right, if you're grabbing Twitter's API and you're feeding that in, okay, you understand the schema, you can map that schema, you can clean it, curate it, and send it in. It's a one-time investment that's good to go. However, if you're wanting to do that on your data and taking your emails and your PowerPoints and your memos and your call transcripts or any other type of, of um, natural language data in whatever format it would be, Anytime the document layout changed, anytime the file extension changed, you needed to go and rebuild the pre-processing pipeline. Ooh. It was completely custom every time. And so this meant that the amount, like the co cost of value and the time to value to get these up and running was extremely expensive. And it also meant if anything changed at all, you had this in this huge professional services um, bill that, that, that came your way in order to keep it running. Right. So LLMs changed that first problem where you don't need these Byzantine model pipelines, but you still face that economic challenge on the pre-processing side. And that's why we're focused there. That makes a lot of sense. And you know, these um, transformer models, one of the things they allow you to do is leverage this attention component, right? Which is basically how much attention the computer spends examining this versus examining that. And it doesn't take too much thought to realize how important that is, right? Because your brain has this. You, you're you constantly modifying what gets more attention. Someone just barked outside or bar dog just barked. Oh, what's that? You you can shift your focus very, very quickly. And these models, I mean, it used to be that you just said go and it had to go through and do the whole thing no matter what. Now it's more like go, but I want you to find this. And it starts down one path and it goes, mm, I'm not finding this. And it switches. So it has the capacity to change its focus and attention. That's a really, really big deal. Can you talk about how that happens and what, what's actually happening under the cover? Yeah. So where we were five years ago, up to about a year ago, is it would look to the left um, and it looked to the right about 200 to 250 tokens, typically like a 512 token window. Hmm. Token about two thirds of a word. Um, you can think about it that way, right? And so it like it had blinders on think a horse with blinders on and it's just looking at these kind of chunks of text and it's looking left and looking right and, look, and hunting for answers and, and looking and evaluating that um that multi-dimensional text space within there mm -hmm. with the introduction of large language models um, what's been extremely exciting is that that 512 token window went to a thousand went to two thousand went to four thousand and recently has gone to 100,000 and beyond. And wow. so what that means is that you can, as you mentioned earlier, you can give it 100 pages of text and say, please summarize this because it can look at 100 pages from 30,000 feet, read everything at once, and then take it all in together. Wow. One of the challenges that's emerged over the last call it three months and some really important research that's been done by folks at Stanford and elsewhere has been looking at, okay, we have these large attention windows, but 
is the first quarter of a document or of that corpus considered the same as the second quarter as a third quarter? And what it was finding was that there's this big donut hole right in the middle that would look at the beginning, the first 10,000 or the last 10,000 tokens and would ignore most of the Interesting. middle. Interesting. And so this is where that relationship with these vector databases comes in, which is like, okay, let's not try and feed it 100,000 100, tokens at a time. Let's give it a more reasonable amount, but then give it access to all of this data that's in a vector database. It's cheaper to run, so the inference cost is cheaper, and you're going to get better performance. That's interesting, too, and I'm guessing that you know the way the data is persisted in the vector databases, there is some element of metadata. In other words, this data is about the color of cars. This data is about the speed of cars. This data is about engines, or et cetera. I mean, I even think about on parquet files, right? On a parquet file, that first bit of the parquet file gives you like the min and the max and some basic information. There was a company, Infobright, that had a database which did that kind of thing. And I think they unfortunately went away. But, you know, the parquet file format was designed to facilitate analytics. And, yep. you know, Databricks solved that iceberg, Hootie, Delta Lake thing by just going to the parquet files. So I'm just guessing there that in, in the mechanism that, that uh, persists the data in the vector database, and then, of course, the LLM is accessing it, there is some component where it can go, oh, he wants to know more about colors of cars. I'll grab it from here. Is that about right? Well, um, it's right in a roundabout sort of way, Eric, and it's a back, it's a back to the future story. And Gary <laughs> Liu over at Llama Index and Harrison Chase and others and the guys at Metal are doing some really cool work here. So uh, call it this past February and, and before, um, you were doing something called nearest neighbor search, so cosine similarity. Right. Okay. So you have a vectorized representation of your prompt. Hey, tell me how to make spaghetti. Right. And it would vectorize that and it'd look for similar vectorized embeddings in that vector database and bring it back together. Um, where the tech is going now, especially in the last quarter to two quarters, has been, hey, there's this whole world over here of of data engineering and these parquet files and all of this metadata that could be valuable. How do we do cosine similarity and all this super, you know, complicated math around ne nearest neighbor search? And then also leverage that metadata to produce even better inference. And so wow. that's, those those worlds are just now coming together, you know, the spring and into the summer. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really it, it's really fascinating too to see how quickly things are changing. So we had another uh, really really cool visionary guy on the show. Gosh, probably two and three months ago now, Bob Muglia who was the CEO oh, yeah. of Snowflake for a while, is now doing something with uh, relational AI, I think. And uh, he was even telling me, he said, three months ago, I would have told you a very different thing than I'm going to tell you now, because that's how much advancement we've made in that short a period of time. And that's what yeah. really is exciting. And there are lots of factors to that, right? The open source movement is a big factor, big contributing factor, just in the mindset of committing code to public and then leveraging it and being able to share so that we all collectively build these foundations and then different vendors can focus on their particular niche, hence the modern data stack and things of this nature. But the fact that we have so much collaboration around this is really quite remarkable and I think speaks to tremendous success in the near future with these technologies. What do you think? Well, it's funny you mentioned him. Um, his most recent book, uh, Datapreneur, Datapreneurs, right. um, just bought for everyone in the company and gave it a copy to everyone um, at our offsite last week. Nice. And folks, this is um, kind of a 40-year view on the world that we're at today um, right. and the importance of data uh, for driving business outcomes. And that yeah. hasn't changed. It's the architecture that's evolving. Yeah. And the architecture is evolving. I mean, that's kind of where I was going earlier in the show about how just having an information strategy. So my my European partner, Eve Mulkers and I, we're going to be working on this. And I've had this theory for a long time now, and we're going to try to crystallize this a bit, but every organization must have an information strategy. And that can be focused on any number of different things. But this, of course, would be one area of focus, understanding what are LLMs, how can we use them, how much effort is going to take, what kind of a team do we need to put together to be able to leverage these things. And that's the job of the information strategy group. And you hash out the use cases. You know, when we had Naveen Rao on the show last week, he said, yes, I mean, marketing, content creation, 
business proposals, the sales and marketing in general, and the content side of that is a big area of focus for us. It's going to be the next couple of years, he thinks. And it's great because it turns every writer into a 10x writer, just in the same way that really good DevOps tools will turn a good engineer into a 10x engineer. And who doesn't want a bunch of 10x writers and creators out there? It it helps you by giving you 80% of what you need. And then if you get good at the prompt, you can get to 85 to 90% and you got to fine tune it on top. But still, you know, if every marketer walked in every morning and had 80% of their traditional job done for them, that's a pretty good change in, in workflow and in productivity increase, right? It's not only that, um, it's it's triggered a foot race and it's, um, and, and it's a foot race in terms of productivity um, within this economy that we're all operating in. And so what you're seeing now is shareholder pressure and competitive pressure to yeah. adopt and integrate this technology as quickly as possible because it's producing true quality and, and improvements in, in the work that's done, but also the efficiency with which it's accomplished. And so I think one of the, the most surprising things over the last year has been that a lot of the, uh, you know, over the past decade, the expectation has been that low skilled jobs were going to be the first impacted by AI. Right. What we're seeing in practice is that it's actually high skilled jobs and creative jobs that are impacted uh, most rapidly. Yeah. That's thrown everything sideways. And so McKinsey, Goldman Sachs are both extremely bullish on, um, uh, you know, the, the effect that these models are going to have on growing the economy, but it's going to reshuffle it at the same time. Yeah. Well, and we're also going to see some organizational changes too. I was talking about this last week on the show in, in hierarchies, in teams and how you build teams and who's responsible for what in certain teams. You know, I mean, I think back uh, to my old days in, in the print press world where you had this whole linear process of, of laying out the paper and getting all the articles written and getting it approved, et cetera. And it was very linear. It was very waterfall essentially, and not very dynamic. Once you printed 80,000 copies of something, well, it's printed. <laughs> you're not going to be updating that document unless you're going to print another 80,000. And so it's a very different world. And that's kind of like what we are in, in this world today, where the web comes along. Now I can publish something and I can change it instantly. If there's a mistake, boom, changed. We got it out of there, right? Even if you think about databases, how it used to be overwriting records and databases, now we're appending records. So all these, these dynamics are throughout the business world. And uh, I think we're going to see some real changes in organizational structures that reflect that, meaning you're going to get you know, people who were just copywriting, now they're doing more than copywriting. They're actually engaging more with the salespeople to learn from them or whatever the case may be. You're going to see the, the traditional... Um, flow of work collapse into individuals who will be doing the job of two or three people. And even AI is doing that. I'm seeing companies like Drift, for example, are optimizing what used to take three or four different people. They're all doing it in real time by scoring someone who comes to your website, creating some copy to send to them and all this stuff. It's like, wow, that's how, that's how day-to-day -day life changes, right? One of the most forward-leaning organizations I know folks probably won't believe me on this is actually um, the Pentagon and the intelligence organizations. And you know, I have, a, I have a background in intelligence, and we've been doing a lot of work with them from the very beginning. And the world that they're envisioning is similar to what a lot of other enterprise leaders are are are, are beginning to embrace. And what we've seen reflected um, on, on our end in the open source community is that you have this underlying um, analytic engines in the form of LLMs that don't require as much retraining or fine tuning. Mm -hmm. um, if you have your data available um, and provisioned, like what we're helping um, to do, then what can you do? Um, you can quickly build apps on top of that scaffolding. They're actually calling that AI scaffolding. Um, Craig wow. Martin, the chief data and AI, AI office, and they envision a future where you have these cheap, fast apps that are quickly built on top of the data and these analytic engines. That's crazy. And you're not you're not having to spend years building this. You can have internal teams that are doing this, and that's amazing. We'll be right back. All right, folks, back here on Inside Analysis, automating the hard part of data science. And folks, that is what AI does. It automates a lot of the hard stuff, the difficult things, but also the 
tedious tasks, for example, gathering information, optimizing pipelines, uh, just been writing about observability. We have our top 20 list of observability vendors out there. That's all thanks to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is successful because Google had a great vision about container orchestration and about really the next generation of the foundation of enterprise software is what we're talking about. But uh, right there at the end of the last segment, uh, Brian, you were getting all excited about this next generation of really fast and and fast developed apps that sit on top of these models, which is very exciting stuff because now, and, and it's interesting, I'm seeing this as a trend in the marketplace of AI infused apps or analytics infused apps, where you're not just hitting a MySQL database or you know a MariaDB or whatever. Instead, you're hitting some of these models and, and thus can can leverage the power of analysis, the power of AI very, very quickly, that, that's like a Cambrian explosion right now, right? It's one of the biggest stories of the last six months has been the fact that it, this is not just a data science and machine learning engineer world anymore. Right. Front -end developers are able to build directly on top of these LLM architectures very easily. And we first started seeing it around February and March with a huge demand for, for Markdown and other file types um, in the Lang chain ecosystem, um, one of the key kind of orchestration um, tools in the LLM space. And since then, um, it's unlocked um, thousands and thousands of, of new users, so space for thousands, thousands of new users. Um, and it's kind of pulled together different communities that hadn't talked to each other. Um, you know, you wow. had the, the, the data scientists that were working on everything under the hood and they'd hand it off and then you'd have some React developers build on top of it. And now you're having and build directly on top of these LM engines. And it's really exciting to see what they're coming up with. That's very cool too. And we were uh, musing in the break about my observation over the last five to seven years as data science has really taken root and gotten a lot of investment, a lot of activity. I told you that my experience is those teams never talk to the data management teams, which yeah. is like, you know, what? <laughs> like, why would you have your data warehousing people not talking to your data science teams? And that's the answer. The short answer is, well, it's different projects that they're working on. But from an organizational cohesion perspective, you want these people talking to each other and working on the same things because you could be, and that, that's the beauty of open source, right? Is you don't have to always rebuild and reinvent wheels because that's what companies were doing is reinventing wheels every day. And I think the excitement and the power of these models is really going to force new conversations to get people to talk to each other and get a much more cohesive approach to what we're doing, which is going to save money, save time, and do my favorite thing, which is improve morale of your workforce. What do you think? Well, a lot of the you know, AI and ML initiatives within large organizations have been com computer vision, looking at assembly lines, or looking at crops, IoT data, right? And doing mm -hmm. longitudinal analysis on that, time series analysis on that, or kind of, you know, really in-depth NLP projects. And if you introduce new data to any of those, what'd you have to do? You had to go get new label data, you had to retrain, you had to rebuild a stack, you had to monitor mm -hmm. it. And so what you have is you had these um, I don't want to call them stovepipe, but you almost had these kind of experiments in an incubator, right? Mm -hmm. or, or these capabilities that could just look at this little window of data. And now with the models becoming as powerful as they are, you're able to bring to bear a lot more data and different types of data to this analytic um, foundation. Wow. And that's meaning that us as people, right, within organizations, we're talking to folks that we haven't talked to before. And so to, to your point exactly, Eric. And this gets very interesting, too, because you know, I think about the amount of heavy lifting that has to be done to get certain projects afloat and get the analysis that you want, get the the insights that you need to make your decisions. And I think what we're going to see here is a sparking out of all these different ideas from different sources. We're going to be able to get signal from places we never thought we could get signal because people are going to be able to see it in the in the models, in the results, and what they get. You know, seeing is believing. One of my favorite philosophers, Wittgenstein, uh, he wrote this book, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which was really a big joke almost on himself and on the industry because you get to the end of the book and he says, yeah, everything I said, forget about it. <laughs> he says, the, in fact, he said, use it as a ladder to climb up into the clouds and then kick the ladder away. And then you have reached, reached enlightenment. Now you understand things. And one of his big points was some things cannot be said. They must be shown. 
right? And it's like, wow, that's pretty interesting. And that's what is happening when people use these models and start seeing what they can see into the details of things. My buddy, Steve Lucas from Boomi was joking. He They connected an LLM to some of their data. And he said, show me all the different versions of order to cash that we have right now. And it did. And he was just like, oh, how did you do that? So yeah. this learning experience is going to be, I think, very inspiring. Yes, daunting. Yes, a bit challenging or, you know, causing a little bit of fear. But I think on balance, people are going to be like, oh, my goodness, this is really powerful. Let's get the ball rolling. What do you think? Well, 10 years ago, we were talking a bit about big data. What we didn't have to go with big data was big analytics. And right. you had the data, but you didn't have a means for actually harness leveraging that data to answer the questions that you really wanted answers to. Right. You're just curious on that you wanted to noodle on and pursue your curiosity. Do the things that make you human, right? right. Um, that, are, that are uniquely human. And now that we have big analytics, like with LLMs, you're able to do that and to see what folks are able to uncover is um, is incredibly exciting and is unlocking entirely new job, um, job descriptions like um, prompt engineers who don't need to have any coding ability and are getting paid $300,000 at some places right out of the gate. Right. Well, and, you know, just think about because I, I tell you, the, when I first started playing with these things, I'm like, hmm, if you can write in French and German and English and different languages, I bet it can write in COBOL and JavaScript. And the short answer is yes. Yes, it can. And now I think uh, isn't Databricks coming out with their uh, encoder or something or their decode codifier that's calling it something that basically you can pump code into it and say, what does this code do? right which was yeah. the big miss the, the big issue with cobol developers because a lot of these old systems were written in cobol and if you don't have someone who knows cobol hither too you were just at the end of the line folks and you'd have to just work around it but now you can actually go in and this is, is what really excites me is somewhere down the, the future being able to examine entire information architectures and understand the flow of data and systems and what's doing what in which case and optimize that because that's great for sustainability, for efficiency, for data quality, for process quality, all these things. We're going to get really good at not wasting time. Final thoughts from you. I think that um, what we're finding is that language really is the the, the native. Um, what you just described is, is code to text. We have image to text. We have speech to text. And we have text to text, right? And um, and I think the trick is going to be, how do we actually make this, um, like the last 10% is going to be the hardest. And yeah. so how do we make this production grade where you can trust it enough to hand over the work that you don't want to do so that you can work on the things that, that really um, are most rewarding for you and that are the most impactful to the organization. We're at that moment right now where enterprises are just beginning to engage, engage in this. And that's on us as an industry to help solve that, that problem. That's interesting. Yeah, and I think that um, you know companies do need to be practical and understand what are these tools supposed to be used for? Hammers are used to hammer nails. Screwdrivers are used to screw things in. You have different tools that have different purposes. And uh, it's going to be important for people to really understand what LLMs should do right now and what they should not do. Like there's the fun case of the guy who asked it to give him case law that it just made up and it was all hallucinations. Well, yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like that is not a proper use of the technology. It will get you in trouble. But to your point, you got to get someone looking at this stuff, folks. I promise. You know, marketing people, your curiosity people, right? The the people who are naturally curious and want to know things. That's who you want playing around with this stuff. That's who you want playing around with these engines to figure out the use cases. And then get your use cases and and just you know be methodical about it but don't not go down the road, right? This is the kind of thing where everyone is going to be leveraging these technologies in some way, shape, or form. And they're they're advancing so quickly. I'll give you one, we have one minute left. That's one of the other really interesting things is how fast they're evolving and improving. So the problem that was a big issue last month may not be an issue anymore, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so what we've seen is, is you know, uh, folks were really worried about this becoming an oligopoly over the, uh, the the winter months and just a couple of companies owning everything. Right. What you've seen, are, you know, the teams and the capabilities that Naveen and others have built at Mosaic and the good work on the architecture side have pulled the cost down of building these dramatically to several hundred thousand dollars to several million dollars. And so from a capital investment standpoint, it's more tractable. Um, from an inference side, that's that's an area where it's still really expensive and we need to work on. But um, but it's it's far more accessible than it was 
um, 12 months ago and infinitely more accessible than it was when GPT-3 was first introduced in June of 2020. Yeah, that's a pretty fast innovation curve. I would call that logarithmic. Yeah, <laughs> just go. Exactly. It's going like yeah. that. Well, folks, look these guys up online. Brian Raymond from unstructured.io, just like it sounds, unstructured.io, ETL for LLMs. You're going to be hearing a lot more from these folks. You're going to be hearing a lot more about LLMs, folks. Send me an email, info at insideanalysis.com. I want to know what you want to know. We'll talk to you next time. You've been listening to Inside Analysis.